so um, good afternoon and um, what I want to talk about is I'm going to talk specifically about the work of Hot Books and share um, some of the process that we go through and why we publish and all these questions that come up and the challenges that, um, that come up while doing this. So before um, I talk about um, the future of Arabic design publishing, which is of course something that really I'm busy with since we've been publishing for the past 11 years, um, thinking about you know where are we going, what is the future going to be like, what should we be uh, doing or not doing or considering to, to change. And so it's a kind of moment of, of reconsidering what we do and, and trying to understand what we have done so far and how we can make it um, even more effective. Um, and enjoyable for us to do. Um, and I will end this, this this presentation talking specifically about one of the projects that we undertook, which is the Arabic Design Library, um, where, which is a series of monographs that I will discuss more, more in depth. Um, why publish about uh, typography and design in the Middle East? I think, um, to, to answer that, you know, I, if some, when I was a kid, if somebody asked me, what did you want to become when you grow up? Publisher was not on my mind. Even as a designer, I, I never had, you know, the idea that I would ever become a publisher. It's just that my journey in life has kind of led to this, to this practice. And I have gone into publishing in a kind of, yeah, um, innocent way, naive, maybe uh, enthusiastic, I don't know the, the right description. So my first uh, encounter with making books, well, i am always loved reading, so that's for me, books were always part of my life, but making a book was the first book I made, was uh, made because I felt as a designer and an educator at the time that I made it, um, that there was a shortage of information that could help me in teaching and would help me, would help my students also, you know, learn about design that is relevant to the context where they are going to be practicing, where they are going to be uh, contributing to the culture. Um, and so I, I launched myself into a research project totally um, on my, you know, out of personal initiative, you know, not commissioned by anybody, not on a grant, none of that. Um, to look into why at the time, and we're talking about in the year 2000, so, in, and I started the research in the mid nineties, uh, while I was teaching in, in the American University in Beirut, um, I, was, I was faced with this question, why don't we have um, typefaces, Arabic fonts that we can use that were, you know, um, from this time and age, because what was, what was available at the time were software where you have to kind of the fonts were embedded in the software, the fonts were digitized from 1950s or 1960s or 1970s uh, variations that were made maybe for other kind of printing uh, platform or type making platform or typesetting platforms. Um, so they didn't really fit. And I remember the first book I ever had to design, which, um, which, which was in Beirut, I had to kind of design the Arabic part on one software and the English part on another software. So it was kind of really weird to combine these things and to work with them. And so I launched myself into this, this I asked myself this question, why is this the case? And then I kind of went into this, this whole journey. And ever since I'm kind of, that's all I do is do work on typography and design in the region. Um, so down the line, you know, it, it, I realized that we actually needed more than just uh, a, few, a, a publication or a few publications. It was the first publication in English that was specifically on typography, on Arabic typography. <clears throat> and of course, it was a kind of compilation from different sources and, and then finding, you know, the information and looking uh, of how they made sense and how they are relevant to, to, to designers was, was a journey by itself that I don't have to go into. But in, in a way, it kind of put my mind into thinking, well, maybe we need a platform where these kind of research can happen, where people, designers can talk to each other, find out through each other, through practice, you know, through their practice, through their problems, their challenges, kind of help each other. 
And so that was kind of uh, the, the beginning of the Khat Foundation and the reason why we, we made this platform um, that was launched in 2005. And uh, the foundation, you know, we did a conference, first, first big activity we did, which was very successful in the sense of bringing graphic designers, type designers, and people working in technology and calligraphers. So different fields that I, are connected, but also independent to be in the same conference to talk to each other. And I think everybody who came to that conference actually really uh, felt like they learned a lot from it and they enjoyed this encounter. Um, and then the foundation, we started organizing workshops and we do other things. But as we went along, you know, the idea of continuing research that is practice-based was very important. And so we, I will talk about just three projects very briefly because they are the, they were also the, the seed for making this, pub, this publishing house. So we started with this idea, okay, so the first book I made was published by Saki Books who were, um, as you know, specialist on Middle East, uh, Middle East anything, Middle East studies, Middle East art, uh, but there was no, no uh, specialized um, publishing houses on design. The second book I made, which was a, 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 a result of a research that was practice-based research, was also pub was published by uh, a specialized, um, a publisher specialized on graphic design but then he was based in Holland. And so, you know, by, by contacts and things, he found it interesting. We published this publication, but you know, it always felt like you had to go somewhere that was not quite published, not quite specialized in what you really want. And so they were always a bit hard time, had a hard time publicizing the book, had a hard time selling it, um, didn't quite understand, you know, you had to kind of like convince them it, was, it wasn't just easy to go and, and publish a book that I felt at the time were very important books. Um, so based on that, you know, from these experiences, I thought, yeah, if things in life don't, don't exist the way you want them, you have to make them. You know, you have to say, well, if there is no publishing house that is specialized in graphic design, in typography in particular, in the Middle East, about the Middle East or about yeah, the Middle East, then you have to make one. It's not comp It must be possible, right? It is possible. So that was one of the reasons we made this publishing house. So it became a kind of uh, extension to the foundation. So every time we had a research project, we already had, you know, we didn't have to go looking for or begging a publisher to do it for us. We did it ourselves. Um, having said that, I have a lot of respects for other publishers as well, because as I, I started working on this, I realized that actually there's a lot of challenges. And the reason, you know, if people want to make publishing and make a living out of it and make it into a business, then they have to take other considerations than whether what is being published is important or not. Um, but we decided that, um, you know, with the experience we, we, we face, and I will discuss the challenges at the end of this, uh, come, uh, this presentation, but what, what we decided from the beginning is that, okay, we know this is a very small market. We know it's challenging for many reasons. Um, one is it's a very small market. Two, it's um, an audience. Most design, uh, most graphic designers don't like to read that much. So it's not an, a reading audience. Uh, we're not, uh, we don't want to make books because, um, you know, they hit a very like uh, in topic or they are very timely and they're going to make a commercial success. We wanted to make books that we like to make. It's that simple. Books that we think are really important, um, that they have, that they give an alternative, that they are either a result of a, of a serious research or they're all result of serious research actually. Uh, but they are either um, like a, res a result of a new research or they are documenting history or they are documenting new technologies that have to do with, with type design and typography and graphic design. Um, and for us, it was important to show this kind of alternative history, you know, that is not, not easy to publish because not also not, not, not often written about. And if it is, it's kind of snippets here, an article there. Uh, a little information there, especially at the time when we started. 
Um, well, I, I think it also remains the case because I think we are still the only publishing house that has specialized in publishing on Middle Eastern graphic design and typography. And we are maybe expanding it to a little bit broader visual culture issues, but for the time being, not, not yet. Um, we wanted to do work that will inform about the region, but also inform people from the region about what existed, which is something we also lack. You know, it, it, for us, it's like a, a combination of doing research, excavating history, uh, documenting things, uh, and then making them possible by putting them in books and in publications that will be there for a long period of time. We wanted it to be also writing that is done by people from the, the, the culture, with, from within the culture. So as much as possible, we don't exclude other writers, but we really wanted to focus on writing from, on writers from the Middle East, that they write their own history. I think that's really an important, for me personally, it's important. Um, and it's also, I think it gives a very different perspective than an outsider's perspective. And that outsider's perspective we already have in our educational system because we always read about uh, the history of graphic design in the West and Germany and uh, older European things. And of course, there's nothing wrong with that, but we don't have a connection to what happened within, you know, right under our noses. Um, so, and that history, writing that history or right, discovering that history, uncovering it and actually writing about it and documenting it is a process that is very delicate. Yeah? Um, so you have to, dis, you know, there's a lot of issues to, to cover. There's a lot of information to cover, but they are not easily accessible. So these are some of the goals that we started with and we thought, you know, if, if we, we, we were going to make it so that we don't make money, but we don't go bankrupt. That was the, you know, let's try and stay in business for as long as we can. So the first things that, uh, that, that started our projects, like I said, were these research projects that I was doing um, on, on trying to create or trying to facilitate research and development of, of uh, Arabic typography and Arabic fonts that were relevant. Each project had its own uh, parameters, but they were kind of contemporary experiments and contemporary uh, with, with different goals. So a lot of them had started from, you know, we did three projects so far and they each start with very practical design needs, addressing these needs, addressing the cultural issues, trying to bring people from diverse cultures together because sometimes, you know, people you read and especially nowadays you read about uh, people writing and talking and, and about decolonizing this and recolonizing that. And, and these kind of things, of course, are important to bring this, this alternative knowledge and this alternative history and to give it a platform on a worldwide. But it's also sometimes there's a danger of creating borders and separating people and saying, you know, we are us. So when I say we would like our publishing house of people from the Middle East to write about the Middle East, I don't want to say that that's excluding others necessarily. Um, everyone has the right to write about everything and to talk about every culture. And it's important that this discussion is open. So with these research projects, we really did bring designers from different cultures to work together. I think when you have to work together and produce a project together, you have a different conversation. You, you're, the conversation is intense and concentrated. So the first time we did this project, we called it typographic matchmaking, like, you know, bringing matchmaking people together, but also matchmaking scripts, matchmaking cultures. And we produced, um, so there was a team of, of designers, Dutch and Arab, and they each produced, each team produced a typeface. Um, and then we presented this typeface, uh, you know, they did their, their own research, they came up with solutions, and this is some of the examples of the work they did. And then at the end of this, we kind of produced, we produced a publication that really um, explained, you know, their process, what they were thinking of, how they thought about bringing cultures together through the, the script and the design they were making, how they borrowed from each other, what kind of conversations they had, what kind of considerations they had. And that first book was also had to go to, you know, it was published by a Dutch publisher because there was nobody to publish on, on design in the Middle East. Um, 
So we produce this and we produce a very nice event from it. And then, you know, down the line and in kind of like maybe 10 years after the fact, we thought it would be really nice to document the way we presented this project. And so we created this book that you see in the beginning um, called El Hema, which was the name of the exhibition. Um, and then we produced a book about that. But the book is also about cultural collaboration in, through design. The second book uh, and the second research project we did, we, uh, we, we did the same um, recipe, so to speak, of bringing designers, Dutch designers and Arab designers together. Uh, in this case, it was about creating uh, typefaces that are bilingual. So in both scripts um, to be used on, in, in architectural, in architectural um, applications and, and three-dimensional uh, applications. And, and in this mix, this was, um, we decided this was the moment where we decided, okay, this is the moment I really would like to have my own publishing house. And so we set up a publishing house uh, with my partner. And, um, and this is, in fact, our first publication. It was very nice to have that first publication because the project had really kind of comfortable funding so we could produce a really beautiful publication with it. And then we opened it up to not only the experience of the designers that were working, but we also invited other researchers and writers to kind of contribute on the topics that were raised through the research. So the book is pretty wealthy with different perspectives, uh, looking at you know, the history of lettering, let's say, um, in traditional architecture in Cairo, but then also looking at you know, graffiti in, in Beirut and political graffiti in Beirut and what people were writing on the street or you know, things like you know, re-gentrifying areas through typographic design and murals in Rotterdam. So it was kind of like a really nice mix of different, different, different topics and perspectives. Um, this is kind. This is a bit uh, some slides from the team that was working on the on the research project, the designers themselves, and the kind of trips we did and the intense uh, conversations we had throughout the project with also with the audience. So we kind of visited places and had conferences and talks, and then there were guests, and then it was really a nice exchange to also kind of evaluate how you're working on the type design itself. And this is some examples from it. And then the third time we did this project, and this is a book that's still in progress. It's kind of really behind, behind schedule, <laughs> but uh, it was about specifically the, the situation in, in, in Morocco, where you have three different scripts that are the Arabic, the English, um, well, the Latin, and the Tifina, which is the, the Amazigh uh, languages, the script for the Amazigh languages. And so we had also a team that is multicultural that worked on, on creating three typefaces for that. Um, and this is a little bit the idea. So this is the Tifina, Arabic and Latin, and the different approaches that people um, took in developing their typefaces. Um, then I, I, we, we worked also with, um, with creating publications that come out of exhibitions. So this was a different kind of research that was more research on the ancient scripts of Arabia and then taking these, uh, this, this um, research and, and making a kind of yeah, presentation of that and then applying these scripts into new uh, design, um, yeah, design products. Uh, like jewelry, fashion, textiles, etc., furniture, ceramics, and then kind of making a publication also from it. Um, and the last project that is really the topic, I think, of this is is the most you know, in in some ways, the 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 research on the history of the scripts and these have something to do with looking back rather than looking forward. So the first two. The, the, the research on the typographic matchmaking was really trying to look forward to see where we can, you know, bring the discussions about Arabic typography beyond, you know, traditional calligraphy, beyond what we know, which we have lots of, lots of publications and examples of, you know, where do we go next? What is the next shape that these fonts should take? So in this project, you know, while I, I, I was working on publishing and research, I realized also that uh, through discussions with uh, friends and, and colleagues and um, colleagues that have just recently published a whole um, history of Arabic, Arab, Arab graphic design uh, 
by Yashab and Hassan Nawar, they, they made a kind of survey of, you know, of a certain period on, on the history of graphic design, which I think is a very valuable book. We decided before they did their book, but we decided to not, not go in that direction. We wanted to really look, <clears throat> and for me, that's a very different approach, <clears throat> to tell the story by telling the story of the designers themselves. For me, that is something that most, a lot of times we forget, you know, we see work and we see, um, we see especially recently, you know, with all these images that you find on Instagram and people that put their collection of stamps or collection of street signs or whatever, and they call it an archive, which is technically not an archive, um, but a collection of images. Um, they put that out, but it has no context. And that's really very problematic for me because I think it's very important to understand you know, the designers that made this work, what were they thinking of? It's not just visual, it has a meaning, it has a purpose, it has, um, it tells something beyond just the artifact itself. And that you, when you dissociate that and you make it into just banal pictures, uh, you lose, you lose the value of design. Um, and people start to think, you know, uh, that, that being a designer is something that is like, okay, you know, some, something that you do for a living, but it's actually not that important, which is in fact quite wrong. Um, because designers work are so prevalent in society, they influence people's thinking, they influence people's aesthetic sense, they influence the way that we read and in understand information. So it's very important to know who these people are and why they were doing what they were doing. So this launched this, this, this uh, library that we called it library that we wanted to create monograph that are really very deeply research about, you know, they are concise, but they are still a, a very serious research about uh, a, a designer, their body of work, but also their particularities. And we tried in this series to create an overview of what is happening in the Arab world at the time. We, we, we kind of limited it to like, let's say, starting 1950s to 1980s. So looking at the older generation of designers, you know, our, our, our predecessors are people that we should know about. And often we don't know enough about or not really not properly. Um, so we wanted to look at them and then we tried to find, you know, make it spread as much as possible across different countries in the Arab world, uh, but also look at different specializations. So people that work more with illustration, people that work more with typography, people that have uh, done uh, specifically research on fonts. It could be a very big project that they, somebody worked all their life on. It could be a direction that they've done, you know, a specialization they put themselves in. And we try to find what I would call the pioneers of design because a lot of them uh, really worked all their life and all the people that we will feature, we are, it's an ongoing series. Um, they worked all their life on in a very concentrated way um, and in a kind of consistent way in, 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 in many cases. And it's really good to see like the trajectory of their lives, you know, to, to see the developments that they've gone through. So I'm gonna show you some examples of those. We started, the first book we did was on Henry Tuni. Henry Tuni is uh, probably, if you're Egyptian, you know him very well because you've seen all his books. He's, he's famous for all the children's books he's done for Dar Shuru. But Henry Tuni is more than just that. You know, he's done, I mean, not that that is not enough, but he's amazingly prolific. Um, he's done a lot of uh, work I mean, he, he is trained as a designer. He worked all his life as a designer, but he's also a painter. And he did uh, a lot of publications, a lot of book design, not just cover design, although he's known for his cover designs for uh, big publishers in, 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 in Egypt, like Dar al-Hilal, like uh, Dar al-Shuruq. But he also did work in Beirut for a period of time for Muassasat Dirasat al Arabiya and Nashid Muassasat Dirasat. Anyway, one of those impossible long Arabic names. Um, so he did he did a lot of, of, of public of, of work on 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 design, and he was very um, he had a very particular style. We were very interested, you know, the research that was done was done by Yasmin Tan, who's the author of this book, and she really looked at not just 
what he was famous for his illustrations, but also the work that he's done on lettering, the way he worked with uh, magazines and publications, his playful experiments with, with layout. So covering all the aspects that he came up with and his relationship to history, you know, because in his work, he references a lot of history, but then he takes liberties and makes very, you know, playful illustrations that could only be Egyptian in some ways. Then you, then we published at this in the same year an, an, a book by, uh, uh, that was written by Yara uh, Khouri Namur, and she uh, worked on the, the, the typographer Nasri Khattar, who has also <coughs> dedicated his life to uh, a type system, to creating this, this system that he called Al Abjadri Al Muwahada, and this idea of actually liberalizing or um, yeah, innovating and, and restructuring the Arabic script and making it easier to read for beginners and for children. And then it became, you know, his lifelong experiment that he worked on. And the book really documents this journey and, and also puts a lot of the work in context with all these movements that were happening, you know, about how to teach children, all these theories like the Montessori school series, you know, how to make uh, reading accessible, reading an experiment, how, how, how do we use that um, as a tool to make, you know, people at the, at the time that he started, a, uh, nations where there was a lot of illiteracy, how to, how to facilitate literacy, how to make it, how to make people easier, uh, easier, have an easier time to read. So he made a lot of work. So this book documents this story and looks at, you know, his process of, of designing as well, because he was also an architect and a designer. And so he was thinking in, in all these social issues, but he was also translating them into form. And what was, what was his considerations, how he did it, how he wrote about it and so forth. In his case, for example, like in the case of Hilmi Tuni, there was no archive, but the man is so prolific that you go in any, you know, um, you, can, you can find his work everywhere. You can just go shopping for books, for children, you have tons of stuff. So his work was everywhere. In Khattar's case, it's different because his work was not everywhere. People used it in many, in many, uh, in, in that period of time in the 1950s, they used his fonts and they existed, but it's, it's a story that is um, not anymore in this time and age. But the, the lucky part about, about his story that I think is very interesting, you know, because here we're talking about archives, is that he himself archived his work in, incredibly. He had everything. He had everything documented. He was super organized. And at some point, you know, um, um, Yara went to, 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 to look at what he had and she was completely shocked by how much there was. She was not aware of it. What was nice in the end, because he passed away after, you know, the book was done after he's been, uh, he had passed away for quite some years. So it was also working with, with the family and the family eventually, because we published this book, could actually find a place to house the, the archive. So they moved the archive to the, to, from the house of the person or home to the, um, the library of the American University in Beirut. So that was very nice that the book was also a, a way to, to give value to this work because otherwise it's just a pack of old papers and you know documents and things that, that have no value by themselves but have a cultural value. And so how do we bring that? How do, you, how do you bring that out? A book is one way to bring it out. And that, is, that was very nice to see that, you know, our book was useful for the family as well. And also for saving this archive from completely disappearing because in, public, in private places, you don't know what would happen to it. Um, then uh, Yasmin Tahan also made a book on Abdul Adir al Naut, who's another pioneer Syrian uh, designer, who also was the first to set up a, a graphic design school in, in Damascus, in the University of Damascus. And she goes over his work and all his peculiarities and all his experiments with, with you know, the, the Arabic script and the playfulness and the graphic quality, which is very apparent in his work. Uh, we had the book uh, on, um, published on Dia al Azawi, who's a, a very well known uh, visual artist and painter and sculptor and uh, artist bookmaker. Um, 
but he he had a period in his life where he worked uh, he did create graphic design work and he was very open to to show that work because that work never gets the attention as the work as his work as an artist because he's more famous as an artist his work as an artist is considered more yeah it's more known um so lina lina hakim worked with him and Again, this was another example of a person that had an amazing archive and is super organized. So it was a real joy to work with him also that other than the fact that his personality is fantastic. Um, so he, we made the documentation about his work for um, that he did uh, for posters, for, uh, for cultural projects that he was working on. Also, Part of the book is showing, you know, his own lettering that he uses in his printmaking, his own drawing. So his relation between art and design in his work is really very close and, and very uh, fluid. And the last uh, three titles that came out uh, regrettably in 2019, like when everything was locking down, so we never had a proper presentation of them. Um, they came out in 2019, and one of them I wrote myself, which was on Kabil Hawa, who is a graphic designer, and he's one of the uh, first um, design studios to develop their own font uh, typefaces. And he has a very particular style in, in working with the Arabic script and designing fonts that is all his own, that is kind of like really close to his handwriting, and he had his own ideas of creating a contemporary typeface. So his, 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 his writing, um, his signature of fluidity between, you know, making three-dimensional typographic sculptures to designing fonts to designing visual identities is all very, uh, very clearly documented in the book. And it brings also work that is maybe if you, um, most of the work was produced for Saudi Arabia, even though the studio was had they had a studio in Saudi Arabia and and in Beirut. Um, but a lot of the work has has a kind of context in both places, which is very interesting case study. Also, how do you design across Arab countries, um, and what kind of work was being produced, and so forth. And then we did also a book on Emil Menaim, who is. Um, I think known like his work is 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 known because it's a lot of uh, the things that he produced that uh, his 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 strength was producing magazines and newspapers that were in Arabic for the Arab world and they're still you know he's still living and, and producing that kind of work and it's of course work that you see every day and you come across but you know nobody like people take it for granted. And I remember that, you know, I was fascinated that he was the one who designed Al-Akhbar because Al-Akhbar was the first time you see an, 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 a newspaper that just completely moves away from the traditional look of newspapers and all his experiments. So uh, Lara Bala did his, her research with on his work and then, you know, spent quite some time with him to find the pieces and to organize the material. Um, it's always, in, in, in some ways, when you are working with a living artist, it's easier in that sense because they are there. But, you know, they, they, most designers are sitting and working and they have no time to, to organize their material. So sometimes you're, you have to spend time with them. And if they are still practicing, they have other occupations. So the, the, the research takes time and the organizing and archiving of this material and documenting it takes extra time. But there is a very uh, uh, good advantage of having like direct conversations with them about what they are doing and what they, are, what they have done and why they have done it and how is it, you know, how is it evolved over the years. So this book is really important because it's important to also look at things that we use every day and look and give that value, you know, the newspaper, what it looks like, what, what is the choice of images. Why does he design the typefaces for the headlines? You know, what does he do when he thinks about what kind of logo type to create or masthead to create for this newspaper or for this magazine? Um, and the last one uh, we did um, in this series was on Salwa Raudash, another very well-known uh, artist. And she's more known for her sculptural work, but uh, she has also worked you know, this was also another interesting case where you have a design, uh, uh, she's done a lot of design work, not necessarily graphic design, she's done a little bit of graphic design, but her language, her art language and her work as, as an artist 
had something graphic in it. And it's very interesting to see that, how she applied that into other things like her textile designs, her objects, her cutleries, her jewelry, her fashion uh, style, um, yeah, fashion uh, pieces. Um, and this was again a work that was done by uh, Yasmin Ta'an. She did the research on the publication. Um, and this is some of the examples. So you see a bit, you know, the connection between the tapestry, the paintings that she's done, the sculptures, her brooches, and even like book cover designs that she's done for friends. Um, I hope I'm not taking too much time, but okay. I want to finish this talk by saying like, you know, uh, there's a few issues that we've had to, I've had to look at as a publisher. Um, you know, as, as, a, as a designer, because this is my background, I'm, I'm a, trained as a graphic designer, I do research on design and typography, and I work as a designer, I work as a curator of design, of design exhibitions. So for me, I'm totally in the world of design. And then when it comes to publishing, you know, I've been asked, like, how do you choose, you know, what, what, what kind of topic to make a book on? Um, what, how do you feel, you know, what is your responsibility? And I think that's a very big thing to say, like, what is your responsibility? I don't know. I'm, I think the responsibility is to make work that is honest and authentic. And then, of course, you're going to choose things that you, you, have, you feel is valid because you're investing so much in it. You're not going to talk, work on a, on a topic that you think, huh, I don't know if it's not, you know, I don't know if it's valid. Um, but I think you also have to trust the fact that you have experience and that you've seen a lot and that you've uh, been involved in design for a long period of time. So your choices are as good as, you know, as, as they can be. There is nobody's going to tell you like, no, maybe this is a bad choice. Um, a lot of times we choose work and we don't, we don't choose to publish on, on, on topics that we don't feel are important uh, for the for the longer for the longer time, you know. So we want to create uh, work that will be valid in ten years from now. Like the first book that I published, you know, twenty years later, it's 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 still valid, and you can update it a little bit. And I republished the second edition because there is always need. There's always people wanting it. So this is the kind of books that we would like to publish. Books that are not like you know, fashionable or, I mean, that not, there's nothing wrong. There's all, there's room for all kinds of books, but sometimes you have to make a choice. We also had to make a choice of saying, we're going to stay a small publishing house with all the problems that that comes up with. But at the same time, we, we want, you know, we have somebody like, you know, like publisher, like Hyphen Press, who publishes very small quantity of books but they are very well researched, they are very well designed, they are very cared for, and they are always a joy for now, from now till forever, probably. And that doesn't, you know, not try to compete and make like a huge publishing house, because then you have to take other things into consideration, which we don't want to do. But then, you know, we had to still, um, face some things like how you know we 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 discover we 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 know a lot of people in the in the in the in the field so we have contacts people sometimes suggest have you seen this work and do you know about this designer sometimes we i know a lot of designers and know a lot about designers but i don't know everybody so people constantly um, contribute knowledge, you know, with exchange, uh, share ideas. And then you have to, you know, look into this work and then some, all the time that we come up with is, is this work available? Is there enough to make a book? How is it, or how is it archived? And so the often archiving or finding the material is, 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 is a journey. It's, it's like a journey of discovery and, and it takes time. But at the same time, I think it's really important that it's done. And so, you know, it's not, um, our publishing has been more than just publishing. It's also been about really researching and digging and helping and supporting. And then also we try, we try to find, you know, authors that are young, that are maybe not, maybe not all of them are experienced. And so we're interested in nurturing also this idea of, you know, writing and thinking critically and, 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 and publishing on your own culture, on design in particular. We've, we face some challenges, 
um, like who are we publishing for? Is our readers interested in reading? You know, um, young people don't like to read so much. Uh, designers, graphic designers in particular, don't like to read so much. Uh, typographers are a little bit better. They really love books and love reading. So, you know, we, we, we also learn as we go. Uh, but regardless of how many people are going to read the book, I think sometimes you have to publish because you believe this book should exist. And maybe someday it will have readers, maybe it won't. And you never know ahead of time. What we face, which is really more problematic, is, um, is how to bring these books to the, the people that want to read them. We discover that um, you know, the best way is to find alternative ways because distribution, if you are not making, you know, if you are not a huge publisher, it's very complicated. Distributing across the Middle East is complicated. There's a lot of there's not enough bookshops. Bookshops are too small to handle books. There's no specialized bookshops in design. Um, those that are specialized, they're kind of, they're, there's none actually, very few. Um, they're either too small or they are interested in like the, you know, the, the big publishers, the big names, the Western stuff. Um, the little pub, the little bookshops have, you know, more cafe-like and social things. So it's not really, really. Um, so distribution through the traditional networks is not, is not very comfortable and it's not very easy to do. Um, we're not very successful in doing it. We do our best, but I think it's it's almost impossible. So we have to think about new models of distribution, uh, models that are more like uh, bringing people together, making an event, so that it is not just about take, giving, you know, selling books, but it's also about discussing and, and like really addressing the topics behind them. And so, yeah, we wonder about our future and, and how we're going to, how can we sustain it or we continue working like this, you know, we, we hope that uh, our audience and our, our readers are vocal, tell us what they think and that we have a nice conversation with them. Um, and thank you. I hope I didn't talk too much and went over my time. Thank you. Thank you, Huda. We, we can go over two more if you're ready to share your screen. Okay, so yeah, amazing presentation, first of all, Huda. Thank you so much. It was uh, such a lovely journey. Um, and uh, of course, thank you, Hannah and Dan, for inviting me today. It's such an honor to be with you um, and always uh, alongside Hoda. Um, just to give you a quick heads up, I think um, it's important at the beginning of the presentation that, that this presentation is not going to be it's not going to be very visual. Um, 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 or it's not going to contain much of the of the of the content from the archive, um, but it will be steered more towards uh, uh, the politics uh, of the archive itself, right? which I think is is an important side of of, of archiving, and we're it's it's important to have that discussion and and bring it uh, to the forefront uh, so we can have a conversation about. It. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so to start, I think uh, something to have at the very, you know, at the background of our, of the rest of the presentation is to say that any theory of, of, of the idea of the archive that would come from this region is, has to be some, like somehow uh, bound to its contextual landscape. So they're, 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 they're not going to be uh, disconnected in any way. So it will be very specific on each uh, uh, on each landscape or location. Um, and most of the things that I will be basically talking about today, uh, I think as also Huda uh, talked uh, um, in her talk, th these were not things that, was, that were obvious to me uh, when I first uh, began. I also began with this sort of uh, um, utopian naivety, if you, if you want to put it in that way. Um, so, 
that didn't that all of that all of these ideas that will that will go through them now were not very obvious to me uh and they were they they are coming from the constant engagement with the topic of uh of the archive and all the questions that they keep on coming back over and over again as we're working uh in this process of archiving um and, it, and it's very important to say for, uh, at the beginning of the presentation that most of the things uh, or, and a lot of the ideas that, that influences my thinking are coming from the Algerian French philosopher Jacques uh, Derrida. <clears throat> and as a start, I think uh, I would like to begin um, exact, like maybe something like what Derrida actually started his uh, famous book, uh, The Archive Fever. And he starts by saying, um, let us not begin at the beginning, nor even at the archive, but rather at the word archive. And then he, and then he provides some sort of an, uh, an etymology of the word archive, which gives him or provides for him a foundation uh, to his later thesis about, about power. He uses uh, these definitions to, as a metaphor for power. Um, and he starts by tracing it back to uh, the word archi, uh, which is the Greek word, uh, which he then uh, says it illustrates two main important principles. And these ones are the ontological principle, which is, the, which is nature, physical, historical, which is basically to say uh, the origin or the first or the principle, and then maybe the primitive. And, and in short, basically, it's the commencement of things. Um, and then the other principle is the uh, uh, nomological principle, which is the, the law, the authority, the, 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 the um, sort of order that comes with uh, human beings commanding. So in the order of the commandment. So it, it means both commencement and commandment. And then he then starts to trace the actual word of the archive um, that comes from the Latin one uh, archivium or archi, um, uh, which in turn comes from the Greek archion, um, and that is basically the house uh, or the domicile um, or the home of uh, uh, the, the supreme or the superior judges at the time, um, and which they are referred to generally as archons. They were called the archons. Um, and, and these these were manifested the you know those who are in power who uh, command um, those with basically political power uh, that and then also their their the documents guardians so like they don't only maintain the documents in their homes in their in their houses but they also protect it and they also have the the right to interpret it as well. Um, um, and the archons, yeah, so as I said, like, they don't just safeguard the, the official doc, these official documents, they also have the power to sort it as well as, as much as interpret it. Um, and so in that way, uh, archives uh, are both places, they are the places themselves, the locations, whether physical or non-physical, um, and, uh, and the law with the power that comes with the law. And so for, for Derrida uh, and his, you know, he, he has been, in his life, he was constantly preoccupied with the concept of the archive as a place where uh, basically power, uh, particularly political power, originated. Um, is, 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 is almost evident in, in most of his writings, even if it was not under the name of archive. Um, and so, in, 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 for instance, in an interview uh, with, um, with a French film magazine uh, in 2001, he states that the archive preoccupies the future. And that idea is, is extremely important for the conception of the archive. Um, and, um, and that very shift of the archive, of our view of the archive, as not a place of just the past, but also uh, a place of determining or predetermining the future makes it a political place by default. Um, and, and, and that's why it should be of concern and all the workings of the archive should be of concern to all of us. Um, and another uh, 
sort of like uh, could encapsulates that he says it is the question of the future, the question of the future itself, uh, the question of a response, of a promise, and of a responsibility for tomorrow. And the idea of uh, this future re represents, uh, you know, uh, the promise is 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 extremely crucial. Um, so it's it's very clear for, to me, at least, that that archives and the means of of archivization uh, has direct influence. I mean, as of course, as Hoda said, to uh, and a relationship to the to the history, to our history, which in turn somehow that history uh, formulates our understanding of the present moment of who we are now, um, and orients us somehow to the future. So, like there, there's a trail, very important uh, trail that always starts with the with the archive. Um, um, and, and here I quote uh, the writer and his, historian uh, Michel Nas from a book called The End of the World and Other Teachable Moments. He said that, that the archive is thus as much about the, fu the future as the past. Um, it is turned as much towards the performative affirmation of a unique event as, as, as towards the past event. And, I, and I'll talk about, I'll explain better what performative affirmation means. Um, and so archives generally, uh, in a very wide and general sense, uh, the, the, it can be said that they exist between what we can call the revelation and the reve revealability. Um, and to illustrate that between, between these two states, uh, we, can, we can talk about three main uh, pillars. Uh, that can easily map this, hopefully easily. It's not uh, it's not an easy topic at all. Um, and there's this this the first pillar is the archived event, which is you know we can say that it encompasses all traces of being everything. Um, and then we have the archiving event, um, which is this performative affirmation, your decision to. Um, the moment where you're deciding to archive something. Uh, and this is where the whole notion of, of archives uh, presents itself to be a bit problematic because uh, this is exactly where the authority comes in um, uh, through a process of identification, selection, classification, and, uh, and order. And then the third pillar, which is a continuation of the of the first two, is or an extension, uh, and it's also an extension of the exercise of that power uh, over the archived event uh, by means of granting access, uh, constructing borders, a physical or non-physical doesn't matter, um, and having total authorship over the material. Um, so let's, I want to reflect a little bit more about these three pillars, just to go through them. Um, 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 so f like the archived event um, and the trace. Um, so what distinguishes the archive from traces generally as an idea? The reader here would argue that it's the finitude of the archive and the necessity for selection, censorship and eraser that distinguishes the archive uh, from trace because you know trace for him was this general wide idea that is very difficult to grasp and very hard to see any limits of it and this is very important because here he sort of parallels uh, uh, the archive to the human psyche and and memory in reference of course to uh, Freud's uh, psychoanalysis um, and that is that you know the human psyche is is finite. We don't necessarily remember everything. We can't remember everything. Uh, I think our own you know, like our very own survival is dependent as much uh, on forgetting as it is on remembering. Um, and the reader really underscores this uh, this point like. Uh, with great clarity, I would say in 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 a in a text called uh, titled "Traces and Archives." Um, and then he, like I think, a quote from this text would be would be uh, beneficial here. So, and it cancellate his 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 
concept conceptualization of the trace. Um, he says that traces are coextensive with the living experience. So like you cannot distinguish both from each other. So it's basically, so it can encompass a whole universe, uh, virtually anything. Um, and there's, this is exactly where, where, you know, where the difference between what a trace is, which is everything, and then the archive, which, you know, uh, which, which is, has this finitude uh, that defines it versus the infinite uh, traces that we have. And, okay, and, and for, for the archive, and then moving into the archiving event itself, um, for that archiving event to happen, some, some sort of authority has to select something. Um, and this selection is, is, is interestingly, is referred to in the reader's writings as, as a great act of violence. Um, and this will always, will always make this, this will always remain the question of archiving, this, this um, inherited violence. Um, and this also constantly puts in question the process of selection itself and everything involving, uh, involved in it. Because with this selection comes, uh, of course, neglect. Uh, what's not selected is forgotten uh, and, and, and lost. And what's selected is saved for the present and the future or, or de deemed as worthy. Um, so who decides the questions are who decides what to live and what not to live. Um, and this is not, definitely, this is not a new or a novel question uh, within archive theory. This has always been there. Um, but it's, 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 it has to be always in the forefront of our general discourse about archive. Um, so yeah, and then basically ar archivization and, and um, is, is not necessarily this romanticized uh, a mainstream process of preservation of the past, but it's also a process of erasure and losing as well. Um, again, much like our memory, uh, we are constantly, as human beings, you can say that we're engaged in the constant process of archiving our own memory. And we have to, to a great extent. Um, and then the third, you have um, Activation, animation, and access. Um, and this is where a few also a few problems also rise in, in relation to institutions. Um, yeah, uh, in relation to a few institution uh, and, and and individuals who are, we can we can say that they're safeguarding uh, physical archives in Egypt. And and mostly. All, most of my uh, talk will be about Egypt because this is the landscape that I can sort of kind of map. Um, and here, uh, of course, the reader draws a parallel between archives and psychoanalysis, as I said, uh, which considers the archives as the collective mind of humanity. There are spaces where it, like the same uh, practices that happens within psychoanalysis can be also be thought of within the archive space. So we intentionally retrieve memories, uh, we revisit memories, we reflect on memories, um, and process information that is sometimes oppressed, suppressed, neglected, avoided, or overlooked uh, in some sense. Um, and so if archives can be considered as our collective memory the, through the process of selection, um, and it is our future, shouldn't we all uh, be involved in that uh, to some degree in the, in the process of archive, or at least the process of selection, um, and the, I think at the very least uh, have a fundamental right to access uh, that material. Um, that is why I think the, the mechanisms that are by which entities and individuals design access to archived material can also take a violent turn because, because if you're not allowing someone, then you're not allowing someone to their own memory, to their own history. Um, and, and that raises a lot of questions as well with it, like who gets access and when and how, um, how the material of the archive being activated and engaged with, uh, what, of, what efforts are made to animate material um, and bring attention to it. And here I use the word animate 
in contrast with inanimate, which can be said to be dead. If, if something is there and it's inanimated, then it, it can be considered almost as dead, which, or like maybe in Derrida's words, he would say living dead. Um, yeah, so, so giving that context, um, that the, the these, uh, the, these processes exist in the process of archive, um, which, which actually, which context do, do they exist in? Like, as I said, I'm going to be talking about Egypt because this is where I can sort of, um, I had my own experience within that. Most of my experience was in Egypt and I could see problems and, and, and issues uh, clearer in that context. Um, and I'll try to map that landscape very quickly. So now for the first thing that you have, you have the national or like the state public uh, archives. And these public archives in Egypt exist, exist in, a, in an extremely paradoxical uh, way um, in the sense that they, that they both exist and they don't really exist. Um, on the one hand, they're physically, structurally there, uh, but at the same time, you know, um, they're either uh, um, inaccessible or inhabitable or the process of, of, of uh, uh, entering or exiting is extremely difficult. So sort of rendered invisible in a way. Um, so, um, and, and so like their physical existence is not at all a proof of their, their function. Um, and I think the condition uh, of these archives have been intentionally neglected because of many, inter of course, many interlocking reasons like everything else. Um, but I think at the center, if I would have to say something that is the, 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 the foundation or like the core problem uh, of that uh, or that led to that problem is I would say that there is a fear of the archive, an inherited fear of the archive and what the archive can reveal. That's, that's, that's a very, very important point to stress on because, you know, maybe somewhere in these archives, like the secret to corruption, to injustice, to misconduct um, that is perpetuated by the political systems can be found and exposed. And that's sort of like, a, that causes like a, some sort of an archive paranoia um, because it's a, it's a paranoia of uh, not namely the archive, but more of an information and context and the truth, if you want. Um, therefore, their approach was that nothing should leave the archive, nothing at all, I think. Um, and so over the years, uh, what, what, hap what happened, or you, know, you can only, you, you need to only go to the National Archive and then you can see it, you know, uh, as clear as the, as the day, uh, that through, over the years, there has been slow movement towards a total destruction of the archives, the, the, you know, the public ones, uh, by means of neglect, abandonment, uh, causing not only, like, not only the materials deteriorated, but also the processes of accessibility and facilitation of, of, uh, uh, of, of, of these archives. Um, yeah, um, so when you, when you think about it in that way, then you could say, Okay, so from that perspective, then incinerations of archives and you know and, and destruction of books generally, uh, they make total sense because they are they are considered as evidences, uh, which of course happened uh, in Egypt uh, during the revolution and and it happened it happened and it happens everywhere, um, um, and so now in the public archive or in the national archive uh, in Egypt access remains still uh, severely obstructed. Uh, the, these poor practices have led um, not just to, um, as I said, deterioration of material, but also the death, the absolute, I would say, total death of research practices. Um, and along that journey, diminishing the value of these materials, so they become sort of these banal objects that no one cares about. And then that trickles down in the system that leads to people, you know, mishandling them uh, 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 with absolutely no care or attention. Um, and just to give you an example, some cultural heritage materials that we can now 
uh, put into brackets that are books, magazines, and, and other maybe newspapers are auctioned sometimes uh, by the box uh, as, as, as old paper. So you can sort of imagine how all of these practices led to that moment, um, which of course it sounds like from, like it can sound disastrous, but actually uh, it turned out to be like uh, there, there is an opportunity there. Um, and that opportunity, of course, was sort of taken on by, you know, private archives. It has been exploited or like I shouldn't say the private archive. I should probably say the exclusive one. Um, and these archives have exploited the, the deterioration of the state archives to build their own legacy. Um, so the, the, the state archives being indifferent at all of, uh, of the benefits or as, as I said before, and I, as the reader would say, of the promise of the archive um, and being paranoid generally about it, the private archive actually welcomed that material and, you know, um, almost possessed it all in a way uh, to like embrace this material and utilized it for its own benefit. By making, so by making the access to the archive an experience that is more or less an exclusive one, uh, that sort of play with this, you know, first and third and second, uh, like second and third pillar of what constitutes uh, an, an archive. Um, so this, of course, I mean, gives the private archives power. That's, that's uh, you know, and, and also, like I would say that unquestionable power right now, because no one is talking about these issues or no one is bringing these issues to the, the general discussion. Um, the, and these powers are the powers of selection and access. Um, and it can also be said, monopolizing and withholding the power to our collective future in a way. So controlling and limiting knowledge, and that leads obviously to controlling and limiting knowledge production to a privileged, um, privileged few basically who are connected to it in, a, in some sense, uh, making sure that, you know, that knowledge produced from it is related to its name in a way, um, in which it uses that production to sell itself back to the public as a space where, you know, where these kind of knowledge can, with these types of knowledge can occur. Um, and then you have the personal collections and inheritances. And, I, and, and here I, I'm sure Hoda also can relate to, to all of the problems that this comes with. Um, and, and, and generally from our observations as, a, as, a, as an initiative that has been working with archives is that there is wealth of material, again, in the language of Derrida, can only be described as in, uh, you know, under a state of house arrest. Uh, whether a personal collection or people who are, you know, maybe still with us or, or the inheritance of people who passed on. And also, I think this is very rarely talked about, uh, and it is also raised, raises tons of other questions, uh, in which also Derrida talks about in some of his writings, questions that has to do with uh, what is private and what is public, right? Um, at which point, uh, uh, or as he would phrase it, you know, what is the moment proper uh, to admit something to an archive? That's a very, very, uh, you know, hard question to answer. And, and then there's this other question about the other. Once the, you know, the person passes on, it's always the other who decides what happens to that inheritance. And is it, the, does it the other have complete control over that material or does it belong to the public? These are all very important questions to, uh, to talk about. And here, I think the metaphor of the archon that we talked about at the very beginning can be said to apply on all of these, whether, you know, uh, being the state or an, uh, an institution or even a person, an individual um, with an inherited power. They have inherited power to move these things around, to decide what to be seen and what not, to give access and don't give access and all of that stuff. And in, in doing so comes great power. Um, and again, as archives are all concerned, as I said, with, with the future, the, the working, the th all of the things that I'm talking about should be the concern uh, of, of all of us. 
because you know uh, these are this is our future in a way as much as it's our past. And again, to quote the reader, to quote the reader here, um, in um, I think that was the archive fever. Um, there, there are no archives without a power of capitalization or of of monopoly or quasi monopoly of a gathering of a statutory traces that are recognized as traces in in the words um in other words there are no archives without political power so we're talking about political power here um so in such a landscape with of course the obvious uh sort of withdrawal of the public archives uh power where is power exactly who who has the power for that uh for that landscape it's it, it power basically is centralized in the uh, uh private archive that for me that's now is very very clear um and here it's 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 uh, here's i think where the digital archive archive can come in acting as some sort of a an accessible extension um to the inaccessible physical archive right the physical private one um and also like the state uh, the state one and at the same time i think under un undermining what's i think more important is undermine the current power structure and central and centralize decentralize the power i hope that i'm not talking too long um yeah that's the digital one um, and of course, I mean, uh, go go for it. Sorry, well, am I uh, am I uh, over the time? We're like, if, no, no. We still have like five five minutes. We, if you can wrap up, sure. Uh, because we need to leave some time for you. Thank you. Course, Sorry to be aggressive. No, no, no. It's okay. Um, okay, so yeah, basically. Uh, of course, the digital archive comes with its own set of questions uh, and problems, um, but a unique proposition that the digital archive can offer, as I said, it can decentralize and dismantles the powers inherited in the monopoly of the private archives. And that's how we can think of the digital archive in our moment and in our, in our context as design activism. Um, and I'm actually done. Thank you. I might actually leave you with one question, one uh, quote from, uh, or it's okay. I'm done. Um, no, please go ahead, leave us with the quote. Okay, so the quote uh, is actually found on at the entrance of, um, at the entrance door of the Center Ar uh, State Archive uh, in the Republic of uh, Uz Uzbekistan. And it says, without the past, there is no future. That's the statement. And thank uh, you for your time. Thank nice you. Ending. All. Thank you, Juan. Hada, this, this was... I hope it wasn't uh, too heavy. This was quite quite the journey. No, no, it was great. Um, maybe I'll start with uh, questions for the both of you as people gather their, so their thoughts. Um, Mo, I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how the Arab book cover archive was conceived um, given, I mean, against the backdrop of all, all of what you just said. How does a designer, uh, how, a de how a designer found herself as a publisher, but how a designer, how does a designer find himself an archivist? Um, and if you could tell us more, uh, so on the journey on the one hand and on the co actual content of the archive for the for those in the audience who aren't familiar with it, how it started on Instagram and moved. And then after, if we can, if I, I can ask Huda to kind of comment and engage with that. Uh, so basically both of these things are repositories of design practices and objects documented in different ways, whether in book covers or in a more like in a deeper journey into uh, the design library as a whole. So maybe I can ask Huda to reflect on those two different approaches and methods to keeping these repositories and how, how does a library benefit from an archive of book cover and vice versa. Thank you. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean the archive the project itself uh, came from 
a kind of hopeless attempt to to um, to find something that I can relate to or something that 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 inspires me that is not uh, Western and it also at one point in time it felt that it, there was too much um, there's a there was a disconnect between me and everything around me which was inspired and affected by the Western design canon um, and so I would I started by going basically on on like these small journeys in old book street markets and I would I would feel so much pleasure being in that in these places um, and some people would be, they would say like it's the dust that comes out from these old books that gives you like the uh, that may, gets you infected with the curiosity bug um, but but I felt really connected to like the visuals they were like extremely visually stimulating all of it um, and I didn't really when I when I compared that to the when I entered like the, the library that is, you know, uh, in like uh, in, inside uh, like a clean library, like a new publisher or something. Uh, I didn't feel the same joy and the same pleasure and the same connection. So I started to sort of gather these tiny little, you know, uh, things that I found interesting at the time. And I would, I don't know, I can't even remember why, to be honest, I, I started this Instagram uh, page, but I did start this Instagram page to uh, share that with people, you know, share that with my friends, share that with the people around me and maybe the community. And as I was like going on these journeys, I uh, like the more I went on these journeys, I, the more I realized that there is that there's a need for for that because it doesn't exist. Or if it does, then it's inaccessible or, or dispersed in every possible location. Um, so as the journey went on, I mean, that was like, as Hoda said, uh, that was like a very naive way of, uh, of starting something. Um, so I started like that. And then over time, we have grew uh, extensively um, on Instagram and on social media. And, and um, since then, things kind of took on. And, and the more I, I dived into the project, the more I realized how important and how uh, foundational it is uh, to projects like you know ho the, what what Huda is doing, for instance. That that could be uh, at, at least a starting point to look at, um, and other maybe inspiration and other forms of writing. I mean, I also write a design repository. Like we we draw on some of the material from the archive as well. Um, and we're, we're in like now the project that has grown so much, we now have like more than 4,000 pieces and not just and throughout our experience and our journey, um, we started to expand what we, what we archive as well. So when we come across sketches and notes and, you know, uh, other forms of documentations and context, we, we do archive those as well. Um, and, and now we're about the 4,000 uh, uh, books and, and, and different instances. Um, and very soon we're going to have the, the digital archive, the digital website, the, the actual digital archive, which will contain all of that material. And we're working on it at the moment um, so that, again, everyone can have access and we can facilitate uh, you know, that access as, as best as we can. I hope that that answered uh, the question. Yeah, I um, can I ask a question before because I actually forgot what you asked me, Hannah. I'm so terrible. <laughs> I have to make you ask it again. Um, but I have a question for actually for for Mo. Um, I mean, I think when you first approached me about this, I was very happy to hear that somebody is actually doing this seriously because what I see, of course, on Instagram is that you have a lot of people collecting things or Pinterest or, or I mean, other places, people collect images and just throw them there. And they are really nice and, and kind of inspirational, but you can, you lose, con you lose context. And I think that when you start and, and everybody starts to call it archives, which is very dangerous because they're not archives. Archives have to be like really researched and they have to have reliable information, or at least you hope they have reliable information. So I'm, my question for you, Mo, is how do you manage to like collecting the imagery and putting it there is one thing, but 
finding like the stories behind this text and finding the information and you know who did what and why and you know putting like metadata in, mm. with, with, this, with this with these images is really in very very important. important. Um, so how do you go about doing it? Um, I mean, so, I'm curious because you know we make a whole book about something. So <laughs> right, how no, do you do it's it's. It? It's it's uh, it's it's very important. And, uh, we for us we don't really uh, our process of archiving or digitizing the covers of books is not to scan the cover. It's to scan the cover and all the possible possible information that can be taken from that uh, piece. Um, so we scan the cover, we scan the back cover, the, the spine, uh, the inside pages, the number of pages. We, if there's, a, if there's an index, we scan it. If there, we, we, ha we have a, a, a list of things that we have to gather from each instance, which is the, who's the author, the designer, the publishing house, uh, which year is it? Uh, if there's any other further information, we gather that. So that's, that's basically, um, that's basically the, the usual way of collecting the data, right? The, like the general way of collecting the data, but there are other instances where we engage or we archive, if, we're, if let's say we're archiving the work of a famous uh, mm. designer, for instance, then we have access to more things and more stories, you know, maybe yeah. sketches, maybe notes, maybe stuff like that. And then we make sure that we get all of that. Um, and, then, and then, so that's the, on the part of the actual scanning event, right? Um, there's this other uh, layer that the movement from this physical uh, reality or like the digital file into the web goes through a process of, of course, uh, adding, you know, these layers of metadata and, you know, um, descriptions of these uh, instances. And that's, that's something that we still haven't done yet. We're in the process of starting that. But all of these are very, very interesting, you know, spaces because we, we, we were thinking of conducting workshops on how do you describe a, a cover because it's not as obvious as you would think, right? Mm -hmm. It's not as if, uh, yeah, I mean, book, uh, like lettering done in the style of X or, you know, the same thing is, or like this illustration style is like whatever. There's a lot more at play and, and it, and it can be as simple as that. It can be really play, right? We can get together and, and talk about how can we describe these, these different styles. And these th themselves can be interesting and can be taken on as something uh, that can be added on the website. And then also that we can also open it up to people to uh, have different iterations of these descriptions or like add on, comment on them. So like there's tons of ways that you can engage with that. Um, and then on the website, we're planning to, to always reference the physical places where these places, where these instances exist in. So that if someone really wants to see the physical um, uh, instance, they can go uh, and, and look at it. And most of all, we always have the ISBN or uh, uh, the depositing number, which is ideally people can go to the national archives and you know, they can take it out if they want. Well, what I think is yeah. very interesting also is that you are archiving material that is not like that is not unique in the sense that you know it's printed matter, so it might exist in many places at the same time. I mean, when I was doing my PhD on, on book design, and actually I did it on you know the the role of design book design as agent of change, and I was it took me ten years to do it precisely because first there is so much material. And then, so how do you first find the material, find the reliable thing? A lot of times it's not, the, the book designer is not mentioned or the book, um, often it's depending on the type of book. It could be only that they did an illustration or that they did the cover totally. And so sometimes they're not even mentioned at all. And you kind, I mean, it was really, it, it took, it really took me 10 years to do this work because I had to do it alone and I had to do it over a period. And of course, there was no archives, but yeah, what is the archive of a, of a, of a printed book? Many libraries, that's the archive. 
So which library to go to to get the best books and you know what, what publishers should you look at and what is the most relevant thing. So it's kind of changed actually the, the, the research changed eventually from going talking about design to talking about publishing because there was a, an easier place to find you know the vision and the, the intention behind the work. So if you are if you are a publisher, you say I publish this work because it serves a certain whatever political ideology I have, type of work I want to sponsor, and then by doing that, I actually select type of designer that is going to work with me. So then you have the kind of complete story. But if you take it just by looking at the images, like at the covers, you could be very yeah. And then then even like organizing that material is even more difficult. And, and of course, we are designers, you and I. So, I mean, I started by just picking the books I liked because I thought, let's start with what attracts me first, you know, and that's, you know, mm -hmm. and that's very valid, actually. I don't think it's a bad idea at all. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really good way to, you know, go to books, book, uh, like secondhand bookstores, whatever you can find, libraries, whatever, and pick the things that you like as a starting point. And then you can start to be a bit more intellectual about it and say, why do I pick this? What does it look like? You know, what is the content? You know, I was looking at the book before reading it. Now, as a book designer, I always read the book before I design it. So it's very interesting to say, can I guess what, what this book is about by looking at it? And if it's a good design in principle, yes. If it's not a good design, probably not. But right. that was a very interesting, you know, process to go through. And then, you know, what you said, like about, you know, the fact that there were no archives that are really serious or accessible and, and that you can come to, you know, public libraries are, are not so, so prevalent in the Middle East. So you always have libraries that are connected to institutions. And if you're not part of this institution, it's very difficult to get in. So you have to figure out some kind of way to get there. When we worked on some of these books for the design library, we had, uh, you know, I mean, there are still books I would like to have in the library, but I can't because the, the, the air does not give you access and, and think they have the copyright, which is very bizarre because you're not taking their copyright either way. Um, but yeah, to convince people that this was a good idea to do is very difficult because uh, nobody understands that you would go into creating something or publishing something that's not going to be any, then there's no profit attached to it. There's also this idea that everything that doesn't make money doesn't, doesn't deserve to exist. And I feel mm -hmm. that it, it's stronger in the Middle East, you know, especially with the heirs. They think that they can sell this, which is, I don't know, maybe they can sell it to the British Library, but maybe not, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know. Right. <laughs> Maybe they can right. sell it. Um, so there's always this this problem of, of you know of, of of questions of trust that you can gain the trust that you have this access whether it's an existing archive that is private or personal or public. There's always this struggle to get there. So I don't know you know once you put it online. I mean having access to making it available online should be. Um, should you should be thanked for that by I, I start by thanking you but every researcher probably would start thanking you but um one thing that you should not be worried about is you know the authority and the power i mean no matter what you do you will always have to have some authority otherwise what you do is not serious i think yeah of course no no of course i agree 100 percent. and and but 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 it's but I think this awareness of the power uh, makes you look at the landscape in a slightly better uh, in a slightly better way, and you understand the the uh, the, the inner workings or like the undermining um, uh, 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 sort of uh, hidden maybe structures that are going on that are not very obvious from the you know from the outside. From the outside, may seem like oh this exclusive thing or like inaccessible thing, but when you think about it, that's an exercise of power. And and I like the idea of questioning that power because once I have that power, I want to be questioned as well. I don't want to be, you know, because that puts you in always a state of trying to, to um, rethink, you know, that selection process. I mean, for me, what I do is basically go through the books like that if they are on a shelf. 
But that instance, that like split second of a choice or like which one to select and which one to take out from that, from that shelf is an extremely important and extremely vital moment that saved this book versus the one before or the one after. Do you know what, I'm, what I mean? So like I'm constantly aware of that power and therefore I'm constantly uh, aware, of, like reflective on my own selection process and the team's selection process. And I would also like, like to invite other people to talk about this selection process. What do we want to, to, ha to still have in the future? What do we want to archive? That's, that should be a constant question. I think we talked about this, uh, me and Hannah, for a brief moment, that this process of selection is very, very important to talk about. And that's why when you have a private archive that, like, that you're disconnected from that process of selection altogether, then things are pre-decided for you what to see and what not to see because it's already in the archive, which has gone through this process of selection that you didn't really engage with, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, in that way, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, please, please. thank you both. This is very interesting. I want to take one of the questions in the Q&A uh, to give people a chance. So Tare Adili, I hope that was correct, asked you both, if you could speak about how the senses related to your respective projects. At first glance, it seems like the visual text, like the visual or textual is centered in your work, but he wonders if you engage with archives of sound or could speak to the haptic tactile element of typography. And there's a shorter question for Mo, if you could reflect on uh, the pitfalls of digital archiving, especially that private platforms like um, Instagram, and I'm summarizing here, have many problems that have to do with data privacy, They're, them being uh, uh, you know, capitalist endeavors, uh, this is not his words, but uh, increase all online surveillance, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, do you want yeah. to answer the first question? Um, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, we don't really work with sound and, and, and that's exactly, I mean, that's like both the first question and the second question, that's one of the pitfalls of the digital archive that there is a sense of, there's a level of experiment, uh, experience, experientiality that can only happen in the physical archive. And you can never really substitute that with the digital archive. And that's where we, we, we like our solution for that is maybe to connect it to a physical place from the website so that you can act, you can see where it is in the in, in the world and then if you really want to because again this experientiality is very very important and it, and it has it can you can develop i think in my opinion you can develop knowledge that is experientiality exper experiential knowledge and it's in in an, in an sort of unrealized kind of way um, and it's very difficult for the digital archive to, to uh, imitate that or emulate that. Um, and uh, so we don't, but, but generally we don't really work with sound. We do work with sound in the sense that if it's related to books. So let's say if we are able to have um, an, an interview with the designer or their, their family members, and we're doing that in some instances, um, then we include that within the, the the whole, uh, you know, let's say page of the of this one book. So if you see the cover and then the back and then all of the stuff, you can, in some instances, and and that's because that's a ton of work um, to be able to provide that for everything. That's that's uh, for at least with our scale is almost impossible. Um, to but you can always find like sound clips and uh, and all the related. Uh, uh, instances connected to that cover and that artist or that author or that publishing house. Everything will be combined together, including video and sound, if possible. Um, and yeah, like the, down, the downfalls of the digital archive are too many, to be honest. I mean, um, I mean, ideally we would have a mix or like I, I would imagine a new form of archive that is a fusion of like a, a, like a harmonious fusion of both digital and physical. Um, but in our case, we're trying to substitute something that doesn't necessarily exist in the, in the real world or not accessible. So we're taking on the digital with its own sort of problems and we're trying to address them 
if we can, um, and you know, as much as we possibly can uh, uh, financially as well, it's very, very uh, difficult. Uh, if it's a self-initiated project, then it's based on funding and these fundings, they usually have limits of how much can you get? I mean, if you, if I have a, if I have all the funding, then I would definitely build a physical archive <laughs> that is that is co accompanied with with a physical with a digital one. But Instagram I, isn't your prime. Are you will no. be shifting to a website yeah. and away from Instagram? I do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So as I said yeah. before, we're working That's on the the website so that it can be available in a in a digital format, but but also definitely not uh, as a social media page. One thing I would like to say is answer to Tarek's. Of course, when you are printing a book, you are actually making a physical thing. And we are very like, um, keen on making books that have yeah, good quality paper, good feeling. You know, when you open it, it opens nicely. The images are really good. We work a lot on these images because sometimes, you know, archival material is kind of uh, like if you are digitizing a book cover, then it's been, you know, gone through so much. So the color is not the original color. It has gone through time. It's got, so we try to kind of bring back the, the beauty that it was originally in rather than uh, trying to show it in its kind of worn out side. Um, so for us, like the physical part is, is, in, is, is you know, it's totally linked to, to the book, to the actual physical books. And I think that um, you know, I personally, not because I, I like to make books and I like books, but also because I feel that when we decided to print, to, to print, really print and not, not produce digital versions of our books or audio books or all that set things, because we, I feel that there is something, there is longevity with, with, with the printed material, that it stays beyond us, that we die and the books will stay in the library and then somebody, you know, will, they will inherit them. They will go into an, another library or another archive or they, they exist. And I, I think that that's important for certain kinds of publications. Like maybe it's not necessary for every kind of publication, but certainly for books that you want to preserve things with. Also, I feel that some of the stuff, you know, my fear is that, you know, with things that are digital, that, you know, somebody pulls the plug, you know, Instagram tomorrow decides to close and shut down everything. And everybody that has put their stuff there, it disappears or it becomes the worse, the belonging of Instagram and Facebook, which is not yours anymore. So it's kind of like there is something about the, 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 the you know, the fact that sometimes you're like, I, I, if I look back at things that I've done research on and I have online sources, I try to find them again. They don't exist. They disappeared, you know. Whereas if I go in the library, I can still find a magazine or a newspaper from like the 1900s. So there is something in, in the physicality of things. Of course, everything can disappear eventually, but it has certainly more longevity than, 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 than digital material. And that's why I think like for publications that you want to produce, that you have intently wanting it to be for a very long period, to exist for a very long period, the choice of print is still stronger. For, it makes more sense. And the tactility and like that it's well made, that it actually survives the times is also important. I hope I answered the question in some way. Yeah, I think for digital preservation, that's something that I've also come across, and I think Hannah could correct me on that. There's a there's a there's a time that you know that the digital format is supposed to live for, right? Which is like I don't know, like 30, 30 40 years, right? That's like the that's agreed very upon. Optimistic. Yeah, I mean, like they're estimating it in that way, but like I hope that you know, in these thirty, maybe forty years then the material in the archive can turn into books and then they can live on a bit yeah. longer. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we're going to wrap up there. It's been a really interesting discussion. Thank you, Huda, and thank you, Mo. And, and just reflecting actually from my point of view of, as a librarian who, who deals with physical books. I have one of the physical books in front ah, of one me. One of my favorite ones. Which, yeah, which is beautiful, which I'm using like to research something that I'm writing at the moment, but equally I'm every day using the Arabic book cover archive because librarians simply haven't recorded the kind of details in catalog records of uh, illustrators, book cover designers. 
Um, so it's actually kind of, for me, filling a gap and it's something that I can actually use in my work. So it's, it's interesting to see these two projects and how they can be beneficial to librarians, archivists, but also kind of a general research public or just a kind of casual person who just wants to actually, for kind of pleasure or nostalgia, to actually see some of these images and to repost them and to you know, share them with friends. So yeah, I, I, I really appreciate both projects. So it's been great Thank to you. hear from you both. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to remind uh, our audience about our next um, talk, which is on the 25th of May. Um, so that's going to be focusing on uh, visualizing the archive Arabic publishing during the Cold War. So it's going to um, look at kind of Cold War Arabic publishing from two perspectives from a kind of the academic research of Zena Maasri um, on her um, recent book, which I also have in front of me, um, Cosmopolitan Radicalism, the Visual Politics of Beirut's Global Sixties, but also from the perspective of the kind of artistic collective uh, based in Berlin, uh, Fehras Publishing Practices, and on their project Borrowed Faces. Um, so there's more information in the link and registration that uh, Hannah posted. And that event's going to be um, partnered with the Delfina Foundation um, and also the um, Middle East History Group um, at the History Faculty. So thanks everyone and thank you again to Mo and uh, Huda. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the listeners also and the good questions. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you guys. Thank you Huda. Thank you Dan. Thank you Anna. Thank you Anna. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.